What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the park, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And, you know, I'm here with Angela Laurie, and I'm going to introduce in a second. But, you know, what I love to have on, uh, Angela, is authors. Um, authors have solidified their ideas, um, and they can really speak clearly, and they have a certain methodology. So check out my episode with Mark Tim. Mark Tim wrote a book with Kevin Harrington from Shark Tank called Mentor to Millions, awesome book. Bob Berger and the, and the Go-Giver, one of my favorites. Yuri Adoni is the author of Unstoppable Startup. He's a Jerusalem venture partner, and they had over 12 IPOs, over 30 million, uh, 30 M&As, exit value of $20 billion. But, you know, a lot of these people, they have authority because of writing a book. So we'll get to that. Um, and before we do, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And at Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 partnerships and clients by helping you run your podcast. And for me, Angela, relationships are the number one thing in my life. So I'm always looking at a way to give to my best relationships. And over the past over 10 years, a podcast has allowed me to profile amazing leaders and CEOs and executives and really give to them. So if you're thinking about starting a podcast, do it. Okay, I don't care if you use us or not, but do it. It's one of the best things you can do. Um, if you have questions, you can go to rise25.com and check out a video of John and I bantering like an old married couple, because that's what we do. So I'm excited to introduce today's guest uh, at her over $18 million business, The Author Incubator. Angela Loria and her team provide aspiring authors with guidance on how to write and publish their own books. And the Author Incubator has succeeded in helping more than a thousand authors write, publish, and promote their books. And she, of course, has many books herself. And I was looking up uh, and reading The Difference, which details her transformational ideas on the 10 steps to writing a book that matters. And Angela, thanks for joining me. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Gary. You know, there's so many things we can chat about. I kind of wanted to start with... Um, you, we were chatting right before, um, and you were saying you were giving advice to a 16-year-old about writing a book, and I'd love for you to share some of that advice, because I'm sure some of it applies to anyone thinking of writing a book, and I love my girls um, to do that, too. They're six and nine right now. Um, what was your advice? Well, here's the thing is I believe that if you have a calling to write a book, and that sounds real fancy, but all it means is if the idea pops in your head and just bugs you for days and days and days, that means you can write a book. And most of us at 16 or 66 are like, am I good enough to write a book? I was actually just coaching a client the other day. They're like, I just need to believe, you know, I need- It's like an imposter syndrome so thing. Can do it. Yeah, and we all, like, here is everything that goes into wanting to, uh, writing a book successfully, wanting it bad enough. Now, if right now you told me you wanted to join the Olympic gymnast team, like, could you do it? Like, I think the ship is sailed, dude. Like, whether you're 16 or whatever you are, like 40, whatever, like the moment has probably passed at this point. But when it comes to writing a book, it's one of those life goals that so many people want, but you actually can have. There's nothing hard about it if you have the right systems, and that includes accountability, the right coach, and the right mindset. And what Carson, this girl I was talking to, said is um, a lot of people tried to discourage me from reaching out to you to have this call. Really? Wow. Too young. She's like, people keep telling me I'm too young to write a book. And I was like, Essie Hinton was 16 years old when she wrote The Outsiders and 17 when she wrote Rumblefish. You're not too young. You have this idea because there's something inside you. And I'm definitely inspired and influenced by Elizabeth Gilbert's Big Magic. The idea for your book, 
we'll move on to the next person if you don't take it. And I don't think God or the universe or whatever harbors will ill. If you decide not to write it, that's fine. But if you've got a book idea driving down the road or in the shower or on a jog, you can do that. That idea is everything you need to know you could write this book if you wanted it that way. Yeah. It's yeah, so, you know, I wanna, Olympics. I want to talk about you know, what's holding people back. But, but first, why do you think people were discouraging her? I mean, I think all of us, like, um, what do they call it, tall poppy syndrome? It's like, eh, a podcast, really, though? There's a million podcasts. Like, <laughs> how's yours going to be different? Really? A podcast? You know what? There could be a million and one podcasts. Yours can be different. And yours might not be as good as some people's, and it'll be better than other people's. But I think we're just in this compare and despair competitive world where it's like, I'm sure her you know, aunts or parents were trying to spare her Protect from any her. sort of embarrassment. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, we could all, there's almost nothing that we couldn't stop ourselves. Like, who are you to own a house? Who are you to bike a hundred miles? Who are you, right? And we have to be the ones in the face of that. Like, sometimes I think those challenges are a gift. Um, you know, I, being a eight figure CEO as a woman, not a lot of us out here doing that. And part of it is like, well, why? I, I remember getting this challenge, but you have kids. Like, why would you want to work that hard? You got to work really hard if you're going to be a CEO. Okay. That's a good reason not to do it, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> and that's well, really the gift, having something to yeah. do. Yeah, I mean, we need champions. We need champions in our life, coaches and, and all that. Um, what, what else is holding people back? Like you see a lot of people and they're probably just maybe they've been thinking about it for five years, 10 years, maybe a year. I mean, what's holding people back from, from getting started and doing it? I had one author who it had been 50 years he'd wanted to write this book. Wow. And the day he published, he like sobbed in my arms. And he was like, I remember the day I told my dad I would write a book. And he laughed at me and told me I was stu like stupid to ever write a book. And it took me 50 more years to believe in myself enough to get it done. I had another author, actually my very first author, a woman named Susan Hyatt. She's got a podcast called The Rich Coach Club. Um, and she's my very first author. And she said to me, I'm really worried about putting this out there. She probably a 40 year old woman when she came to work with me, really worried about putting this out there because my third grade teacher told me I wasn't a good writer and I would never have a career in writing and I should focus on science or math. Like third grade, like maybe your third grade teacher didn't know anything. <laughs> maybe your dad was right. not an expert on, you know, whether or not mm -hmm. you could write a good book. But I, I think self-doubt gets planted. I don't even think people, maybe you and I have sown seeds of self-doubt in others. I don't even think, you know, Ron's dad or Susan's teacher meant to sow that deed of self-doubt. But if I were to tell you the reason my authors tell me when they come to me they didn't write a book is time and money. The actual reason is self-doubt. Hmm. 99.9% .9 of the time. Yeah. So for the author, 50 years, five years, 10 years, what changed for that person? They finally decided, like, why not year 49, 48, 40, year 30? What, what changed in that person or, you know, in Susan or the other person that they're like, okay, now's the time? You know, I think, I think that is the thing. I think it's a decision. For some people, it's birthdays. Um, I just talked to a woman earlier today who said to me, my kids are out of the house. Uh, my life got really quiet with COVID. I'm home a lot alone and I feel like I have the space to get it done. Somebody else told me uh, COVID's been amazing for my career or for my, I guess, revenue more than career. And I have made an extra $35,000 this year 
And I thought if I could invest in the stock market, if I could invest in real estate, like what's the best return I would get on my investment? And I realized the best return I could get on my investment was investing in me. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Right. Um, I, we'll talk about the process a little bit from the common questions you get to the process, to the writing, to the, to the after effect. But I wanted to, we are, we also chatting about self publishing versus traditional publishing. You get this question a lot, but your views have changed. Yeah. It's been a dramatic six months for publishing. And I want to tell you, one of the really, I don't know, funny is not the right word. I'll change that. Unexpected or bizarre things that ha happened is, you know, like the federal government, there's something with the federal government, like, I don't know, I'll get these numbers wrong, but 75% of uh, federal government employees are going to retire in the next five years. Publishing's the same way. It's an older profession. And so when you look at, agents, publishers, editors, most of them are in like the five year window of retirement. And it's been very hard to get people up and coming because publishing happens in New York City and most publishing jobs are about $40,000 a year. Anyone wanna to move to New York City on $40,000 that you know. So other than literally heiresses, there's like no young people in publishing because they just won't take, can't afford to take those jobs. So COVID hits New York City harder than anywhere else first. And you know what happened? All those people in publishing that were going to retire in the next five years, in 90 days, it was just like scattered. They went to Florida, North Carolina, wherever that they felt comfortable hunkering down for the next two years or whatever it is. And they're like, if I leave New York City, first of all, I need cash. So I'm gonna sell my apartment in New York City for $2 million for 500 square feet. And I'm right. gonna buy somewhere amazing in Florida, plus be able to live for a while. They're like, I'm never coming back to New York. And all of a sudden the publishing industry just dramatically contracted. Meanwhile, every bookstore was closed for three months. And now even though they've opened, people aren't shopping the way they used to. Bookstore sales went from 50% to one five, 15% of all sales. So what are you using a publisher for? Well, you use a publisher for distribution and marketing, business to business marketing in bookstores. They get you those book signings, they get your books on the table, they get the posters in the window, no one's going to the book signings, no one's looking at the tables, no one's looking at the posters in the window. Why would you give them 90% of your revenue? All of the sales are happening online and you know searching online is exactly the same whether you have a traditional publisher or not. It's not exactly the same, but it's close. They pay some fees to Amazon so that your book will come up higher in the search if you're with a traditional publisher, but short of a little bit of SEO juice, there are no longer reasons to go that traditional publishing route. It's a skeleton staff. The business is, the industry is preparing to exit. And there will still be traditionally published books for probably another 10 years, but it's the end. we're at the tail end of the industry and we're seeing new publishing models. You see people like Guy Kawasaki and Seth Godin switching to self-publishing, um, this hybrid publishing that you see Brendan Bouchard doing, where instead of the publisher getting 90%, um, the publisher now with most deals with internet marketing guys are getting 10% to get a few books in bookstores but then they're working privately on their book funnels. It just, the story stopped making sense, weirdly almost overnight, but so much of the material online and the keynote speeches, and even if you go to an event, you're gonna hear stuff that's different for me because people wrote those speeches pre-COVID. It's like the information hasn't caught up yet, but it's not gonna take too long for people to realize, oh, wait, what did I just pay for? <laughs> Yeah. And in, in these turbulent times, another thing is we were discussing is the responsibility of a writer during turbulent times. So what did you mean by that? 
Well, I think that's shifted too. We used to get to write about fun stuff. Um, but I know I've gotten much more serious about the clients I'll accept. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we used to take about 30 clients a month. I've scaled back, not because we don't have the applicants, but because there are so many serious topics about global warming, about civil discourse, about, uh, really relationship issues. There are so many urgent problems right now, systematic racism, uh, some of the stuff that's happening with the Me Too movement that we've just really focused on much more serious book topics, partly because that's what's selling. Um, and some of the fun stuff that used to sell is just not selling. Like people. what? What's, what's considered like fun stuff? No, we had books on, uh, we had books on divorce. We had actually divorce is doing pretty well. Um, but we had a lot of books that were in more like hobby territory. Um, we had, books. when you say fun stuff, I picture like fiction, but all the, the typical books you produce are nonfiction or do you no, do, we do all nonfiction? Well, you do. We some fiction. I think we've got mm. maybe 5%. Fiction. Got it. That's usually like high vibe fiction focused on yeah. um, still those positive morals. Yeah. So fun so, stuff would be like hobbies. Like I, I'm trying to think of an example. I mean, gardening actually is probably a popular book now with COVID too. Yeah, but, uh, uh, gardening but, um, is doing really well. Yeah, we've seen a big shift in things like um, our uh, some of our wellness topics. A lot of the topics around. Um, uh, like uh, li finding your purpose, living a joyful life. They're really kind of frivolous in these times. So the career book, you know, there were a lot of like make a million dollar kind of books that have now gotten much more serious. Mm. Um, you know, uh, the assumption in the books we published in the last five years at least has been there's an unlimited number of jobs uh, and why would you ever you know take this job and shove it why would you ever be in a job you didn't like that's definitely changed we're seeing a lot more books on things like um co like conservation uh canning preserving um re uh, selling like re reducing consumption downsizing uh we had a lot of books on style that are definitely not selling as well mm -hmm. so, angel talk about who's who is ideal clients for you oh for me what we work yeah. with are uh, coaches consultants and entrepreneurs that have uh, a passion for service and are looking for more high quality clients so we work a lot with functional medicine doctors. That's about 20% of our business. Uh, chiropractors, actually all sorts of doctors. Um, we have a lot of lawyers, financial advisors, um, life coaches, uh, marketing consultants, speaking skills, uh, building a marketing funnel, sales techniques, and then leadership coaches. So. HR, how to build a better team, how to have a better corporate culture, customer service, things like that. Um, Angela, talk about the process a little bit. So a functional medicine doctor is like, this sounds great. I would love to do a book. They probably, maybe they've been in the industry for 20 years. They're an expert on various conditions. What, uh, where do they start? So for us, and you mentioned my book, The Difference, 10 Steps to Write a Book That Matters. That's a good way to do a deep dive. But for us, we want to, um, Stephen Covey says, when climbing the ladder of success, make sure it's leaned against the right building. So we want to reverse engineer the book writing process to say, if you were perfectly successful, if this book was a huge hit, how is your business different? Usually what that means is more clients. So we say, okay, what did you sell these more clients? And we want people to focus each book on one specific product. So let's say you guys did 
I don't know, podcasts, but you also did marketing funnels and virtual event management. Those would be three different funnels uh, or three different books. We wouldn't try and get clients for all three of those things. So we identify what's the one program we can mm. put with this book. Let's say it was your podcast program. Then I'm going to say, who's your ideal client for this podcast program? So you're like somebody that's already thought about a podcast. It's somebody that maybe has a business, somebody who has a whatever disposable income to invest in. We'll do a client avatar for your perfect client. And we now want to write the book as a love letter to that one person. So we call that person your ideal reader. And I have a background in theater. So I use the Meisner method um, in a lot of what I do. And we do uh, a character study of this ideal reader. Hmm. And we have that ideal reader. Um, I like to do role plays. So you will get into character as your ideal reader. Okay. And you'll identify what are their questions. What kind of equipment do I need? Do I have to rent a studio? Do I have to record all my podcasts at once? What if a podcast isn't very good? Do I need to hire an editor? How much is an editor? And a book is about 100 questions. So identify those 100 questions. And we put the questions into categories. Here are all the technical questions. Here are all the questions about, am I good enough? Here are all the questions about, but how do I come up with content? And we'll take all those questions and put them in categories. And those categories are chapters. And then you can interview yourself or you can use our author community and find someone to interview you. But you can just, each chapter will have about 10 questions. You have someone ask you those questions and you either type or speak those answers. You could speak it using a tool like Otter AI and get the transcript right there. And that's how our authors write their books so quickly is we can really quickly within three days get a draft manuscript out by simply answering those questions that you probably answer all day long anyway. There's a little more to the first few chapters and the last few chapters, but 60 to 75% of the book is really answering the questions from your ideal reader or your customer avatar. Yeah, I love it. And, and so like some of the functional medicine doctor, like, listen, I have diabetes patients, I have neuropathy patients, I have, okay, which one do you want to speak to? Let's speak to that person and the diabetes patients is whatever. <laughs> 45 year old theme or whatever the avatar yep. is and you're speaking directly to that person. I love it. And they and always tell me they can't pick. I see all kinds, <laughs> all kinds of people, all kinds of people. And I'm like, you could write a hundred books cause it's only going to take us two days to write a book, but we got to pick one and start with one. It could be your favorite client, a client you want 10 more of. Now, when you use the book in a book funnel, you use a book to get clients. Who was I just talking to? Um, my client, Dr. Uh, Eva Maria Hassenbeck, she is an ophthalmologist. Now, she's also a functional medicine doctor. She is the only um, functional medicine doctor in Germany that is also a traditional doctor. And she's got a regular traditional uh, doctorate. She's an ophthalmologist with a German army. And she's a functional medicine doctor. A functional medicine doctor can help anyone with anything, but I'm like, give me an eye problem. What's an eye problem? Because what makes you different as a functional medicine doctor is you're an ophthalmologist. So she said, well, I do deal a lot with um, rheumatoid arthritis, which has macular edema, macular something. And so I'm like, great, let's focus on autoimmune eye diseases. Hmm. Now, the truth is, Dr. Hassenbeck can help anyone with anything, particularly autoimmune. So when we go to market her, this book is just one of the things she helps people with. But it's a key way to get her positioned as a speaker, because otherwise, she's just another doctor with another book. Yeah. So we want her to be the functional medicine eye guru because that's a unique differentiator for yeah. her. 
Now, if somebody else, Jessica Drummond, um, I don't know if Jessica, I think she's a doctor. We'll call her Dr. Jessica Drummond. <laughs> she works with endometriosis patients. Why? Mm. She had endometriosis. She's a woman, like this is her experience. She's helped hundreds of women with endometriosis to manage and eliminate the symptoms of it. Yeah. And so- It's debilitating. It's horrible. Yeah. And it's very common. It's like one in four women or something. And so could she do everything? Could she do everything with women's health? Could she? Yes, of course. But we want her to be the endo queen. And owning that territory will lead to people calling yeah. her saying, I know you normally work with endometriosis, but would you continue consider working with me? Yeah. I have vulvodynia or whatever the other issue is. And then she gets to say yes or no. So yeah. we lead with specificity. Um, that's one of the key differentiators of working with the author incubator. And it's really how a book works now in the, I don't know, post-internet age. It's been a process, but general worked better before the year 2000. Since the year 2000, it's a movement towards um, what Chris Anderson called, from Wired Magazine called The Long Tail. Long Tail books do better. So if you don't know that book, it's a good one to yeah. go. Angela, first of all, thank you for sharing that because that's important for any business. This is like an amazing business exercise. I don't care if you're doing a book, not doing a book, specifically the methodology behind a book. I could see how powerful that is because people want to you know, if you're all things, everyone, you're nothing, no, anyone, right? So I love that you broke down that methodology. And, and I'm sure people discover insights in their business that improve their business by going through your process. You said something in the intro, almost nobody gets, and I don't remember how you worded it, forgive me, but um, you said something about how writing a book makes you clearer in your process. No one buys that from me. Whatever invites, 76% of our authors make 100K from their book in the first year. We've had 24 millionaires. 20% of our authors make $250,000. People hire me because they know if you do a book with me, you're going to make a shit ton of money. However, the real value, I don't know if you could get them to admit it, but I watch it. The real value is they know their own content so much better because they wrote a book that they're so much more confident and that's why they attract the business. The book doesn't hurt, but one of the main things a book for, can do for you is get you solid on what you offer. Yeah. Yeah. And also you're, if you're clear on the person you're speaking to, that is huge. Right. And so you can be, you could have a more specific methodology where you know, whatever, the ophthalmologist probably has a million things that they're focused in on. And now you focus in on that one and you do become clear in that customer or client or patient or whatever it is, that is, that's huge for their process as well. Totally. But yeah. not a single person has ever given me a penny and said, I want to get clear on who my customer avatar is. Right. <laughs> I don't think but, it sounds fun, but yeah. I think a podcast does that too. But when you do, someone. but yeah, when you do, you can Game speak to that person and you get more of those people mm. right um yeah, game changer talk about so you're full service though so talk about the next step so now they have this they're like okay great i have this amazing manuscript yeah we've got a four-part process it takes a year to go through our full incubator you don't mm -hmm. have to go a year but it takes a year to really incubate and then people write a second book. We have somebody who's written eight books with us. Nice. Um, but the way it works is the first 90 days you write a book. The second 90 days we publish it, we edit it, we publish it, we get you bestseller status. The next 90 days we have you focus on creating a companion course, product, service, something that goes with the book that's your back end sale. Mm -hmm. And then in the final 90 days, we build an evergreen book funnel. So you have a steady flow of people who are either buying your book or getting it for free. And then once they get your book, they get follow-up emails and videos that basically say, hey, do you wanna learn about my companion program? Drops you into a sales page or um, in some cases a consultation. 
and then you have a steady flow of leads within a year. So our authors start selling and making money at the 90 day mark. That's when the book is written. They know what their process is. They know who to reach. And the first posts and emails we have them do is like, I just wrote a book. It went to the editor. I got a couple weeks free. Uh, anyone want my help solving this problem? And it's totally random. There's no program. We just want their hot little hands on some new clients. They charge sometimes by the program, by the hour. It's a mishmash. Yeah. Depends then, what service they offer. Right. Yeah. And they're still trying to figure it out. It's like, oh, wait, I just offered too much. Wait, that's not enough. Like, I didn't get them far enough. I got them too far. They got confused. They got overwhelmed. And that next 90 days, we're just selling and testing. In the next 90 days, we actually have a program now. So we can launch a beta. And most of our authors at that 180 day mark will make between 50 and 100K on a beta launch where they do a live training of what will become their evergreen or recorded course. Love it, Angela, love it. Um, so marketing the book, what are, your, what are your recommendations, best practices? Because you're, you're walking people through this part as well. Yep, number one, best practice, don't hate me, give your book away. It's so annoying because people come to me thinking they're going to make money from book sales. They're like, why do you want, I'll say, why do you want to write a book? And they'll be like, I just, it's time to add a passive income source. And I'm like, sorry. <laughs> um, there's too Unless many you're JK Rowling, right? Yeah, so, JK yeah. Rowling should sell her books. I'd raise the price. Right. And Brown too. But other than that, there's too many books. There's too much free information. There's streaming services. You are so lucky to get your book into someone's hands. I'm going to tell you how the numbers break down. You give away a hundred books. It's going to cost you about $5 a book. So it's about 500 bucks. 10 of those people, by the way, one of them is going to read it. It's actually 16, but 16 of the hundred will read 16 it. 16 will not, open it. Right, 16 exactly. will read any it's words on it. One will probably finish it, but those aren't your clients. If somebody reads your book, those are the people that aren't going to buy from you. Of the 100 people, 10 will reach out to find more. Of those 10, two will be batshit crazy. <laughs> of the other eight, one or two will uh. sign up to work with you. So if you have a starting price point of, let's say, two grand. You do an eight week program with people and it's two grand. And at the end of that program, they've got their first podcast episode, whatever it is that we can do for two grand. They've got an outline of their podcast. They've got their trailer done something. Ooh, that'd be a good program. 2K and you get your trailer done. Ooh, and then you're kind of pot committed. Um, that's the, that's the formula. So you've spent 500 bucks. You got a client, you made 2K maybe 4K, so I'd spend 500 bucks to make 2K, and then you're gonna sell them the second program. So now we got your podcast trailer done, we identified who's the audience, we did the cover art, we made your, you got the equipment, you got it set up, we know it's working, we recorded the trailer, it's live, you've been accepted by iTunes, you're in the Apple store, now all you gotta do is record episodes, no worries. You can do it on your own. Here's our training course for that. Or you can just keep working with us and it's 10K for the year and we'll produce an episode a week for you. You send us the audio recording, we'll add in the music, we'll upload it. We've already got access to all those feeds. Now what we find are 50% of the people that said yes to your front end will say yes to your back end, that second offer. So if we give away 200 books, we spend $1,000, we end up with two clients at $2,000 each, so we spent $1,000, we made 4,000, okay. And one of those will buy our back end for 10 grand, so now we've spent $1,000 and made $14,000 and we are having fun now. 
And that is the story of a free book fund. We give away two books. Do people resist you on that? Oh, Actually. resist me? You would think I was killing their dog <laughs> every day. Tell them. They just want to sell their books for yeah. $14.95. Yeah. Now, here's what happens if you sell your books. To get 200 sales of a $14.95 book, you're going to spend around $50 a book to sell it. So stay with me here. You spend 50 and make 15. It's not a winning formula. So people don't advertise. Well, and also you just sell less books. The metrics, yeah. I mean, you just don't sell them. Right. Well, that's what happens because they're like, I'm not going to spend 50 bucks. This advertising doesn't make sense. The numbers do not make sense to sell your books. I've never seen it work once. So I love talking about behavior change. So how do you explain it to them? Because there's an emotional reason why they're saying it and a logical reason. Is it as easy as you walking through the number numbers and people no. say, Angela, this why works or how do you easy? how do you ultimately get them to see the light on this? This is my answer. Is it about your ego or is it about service? If it's about your ego, let's keep your book for sale for sure. And then when people buy it, it's great. You can go in your bathroom and take selfies and sell it. <laughs> but if you, what you told me was true the day you signed up, if when you said to me, what matters to me most is helping people was true, then we got to give your book away and help people. Otherwise, it's really just about your ego and you want to feel good when a sale goes through. And that's great. But I'm not into clients that are so focused on their ego that they can't see there are people in need. Sometimes that works. You can give them a t-shirt. Resistance. Ego or service. Take ego or service. That's what yeah. I tell them. Yeah. I want to talk about leadership and... You know, you you went from as I was listening, ghostwriter of something about servers. Yes, Windows really Server Backup 2.0. Server Backup 2.0. That's 2.0. my last book. I did so many. I did a book. Um, I did a book called Pen Computing. That name really took off. Um, <laughs> Bestseller. I, it was. Uh, I was hired by a company called Scion, which had some of the first pocket computers. So yeah, I was at the forefront. I did ooh, 15 books on Y2K. That was a really good use of my time. <laughs> so we go from that, Angela, to a team, a company, and um, and I was talk, watching one of the videos and you said, you, you may really, me really kind of reflect on a couple of things. Um, and you said, um, I'm on the autism spectrum. I, I'm not good at managing people and I need you know, I, you know, have certain strengths and certain weaknesses. And so it made me really think about myself like, huh, like I need to like map out my weaknesses and figure out, you know, be more aware of them. Okay. And, and you're like hyper aware of certain things about yourself. So I'm just wondering what, you know, what those things are, what you feel your biggest strengths are, your biggest weaknesses, and then how you, you know, created this company around those, those pieces. So I don't know if you want to start with, you were, you were talking about a panel you were saying with a couple other yeah. people. Well, I want to go somewhere else with it that I think go will ahead. help everyone. One yeah. of the, before I was diagnosed with Asperger's, which is now ASD, Autism Spectrum Disorder, um, I found a book that blew my mind. You probably found it too, because about 30 million people did, um, which is called Strengths Finder. And the cool thing I think it was in the introduction or maybe even the back cover copy. And it was like, for most of us, we identify what we suck at. And what I suck at is peopling. I say, like I am very easily misunderstood and I really frustrate people. And look, I'm very hard for, for I, the way I described it growing up was I have a bad personality. Yeah. So you don't strike, that doesn't strike me. No. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not saying that to be nice, really. I'm just like, I'm wondering, and that's what we were talking before we hit record. I was like, you said that in the video. I just don't get that sense from you that you aren't social or that you 
you know, whatever the, whatever your no. stereotypical. That's, I mean, that's the thing I talk about on the panel that I want to talk. I want to go back. Yeah, to go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. The thing I talk about on the panel is especially women with ASD. Um, our traits are so different than men and what's portrayed in the media as Asperger's. So it's often um, missed. And uh, on that panel discussion, which you can find on my Instagram, um, so it's instagram.com slash the author incubator, I believe. Um, and if you look at my IGTV, lot, IGTV, you'll see these videos with me and um, some other people that are Aspie. Um, and it's so different, the symptoms in women, to recognize that most women go undiagnosed. So it's a pretty fascinating conversation I had. One woman was in her 20s, one was in her 30s. I'm in my 40s. Uh, we were all diagnosed at different times, and we all had the same experience of people saying, you don't seem like someone with Asperger's. <laughs> like, so back to StrengthsFinder. I know I'm super bad at peopling. And for me- Give me an example of that. And so what do you mean by that? Like where someone say, misconstrued something or- I mean, it's literally uh, everything in my life. But so for instance, I'm really good at strange attention to detail. And so, so let's say I ask someone to give me a report. Uh, this just happened. Who did it happen with? What was it? This is an old one. There's one that just happened today that I can't remember. But um, so I had a, an ad company I was working with and they sent an Excel spreadsheet report. And they had a 25 year old kid do the Excel spreadsheet report and they dragged the formula wrong. So the formulas were broken. And so I got on the call. I was like, Hey, you must've dragged this formula. I can't figure out how this formula is supposed to drag, but see all these exclamation points. The formula is obviously broken. And he's like, Oh, we save that column for later. We use that column for later. I'm like, the column that says return on investment. <laughs> I'm like, that's the column I need to see. Like the reason it's coded green is because if it shows up green, I should know it's good. And if it shows up red, it means it's bad. So if this is a column for later, then you should probably quit your job right now because there's no way I could continue with this company. So do you wanna continue with the story? This is a column for later, or do you wanna talk about how we could fix the for me? And I get so fixated, that column wasn't even the discussion of the debt, the discussion was about whatever, the price of tea in China, but I can't move on. Mm. Why you fixated you on that. A field yeah. that has exclamation points. Why do you think Excel invented the exclamation points? It's so you don't send this to a fucking client because they'll think you're an idiot. It goes something like that. I could see that. Got I it? could see someone taking that. Not, not, yeah. night, not in a good so way. And then the 25-year-old quits and cries to his boss. And then his boss calls me and says, what happened? And then I get fired from the client. So usually I'm not allowed to talk to humans because I can like destroy them accidentally. Oops. <laughs> Came out. I'm usually right. By That's the way. a good example. Yeah. Uh, I, okay. Yeah. That poor guy. Forgot his name, but it didn't go well. So, so strengths finder. Here's so strengths finder. So I spent my whole life trying to fix this thing where I destroy innocent 25 year old data analysts and I get pulled into HR and they're always sending me to rehab. I got fired from like every job. Um, like I make people cry. I don't know why they cried. Why didn't you give me, I was just I'm literally going to teach you how to fix the formula. I know how to fix the formula. Why are you not excited? I'm about to teach you. And instead, like people get all mad at me. So I'd spent most of my life trying to fix this, like therapy and the workshops and the EQ, my EQ is really funny. I'm like on the emotional intelligence, I'm like 95 on everything, except for like this one category where I'm 13 percentile. Um, it's just like, I'm broken in this one area. I did a um, 40 years of Zen where they do brain mapping Okay. And they do this brain mapping. There's like part of my brain that was like a black hole. And they're like, do you have trouble with this thing? And they name, they're like, yeah, that whole part of your brain is missing. Hmm. I'm like, yes, it feels that way. So what StrengthsFinder said is what if crazy idea, again, this is before I knew I was on the spectrum, but crazy idea, instead of spending all that money, time and energy on fixing the broken things about and getting them from like a two to a four, 
what if we took the awesome things about you that were a 10 and made them an 11 or a 12? And I was like, <clears throat> mind blown, because I had spent too many hours in tears in doctors and therapists office trying to fix my broken personality. So when I started identifying like, what am I really good at? Pattern matching. I'm a fucking beast. Building strategy, making people money. Oh my God, I know how to make money. That is just, it's obvious. It's like beautiful mind. It's just laid out for me. Like you want to add a hundred grand? Got it. Give me two seconds and a whiteboard. We're there. Like, what were the things I was good at? And I was focused on those. And in the process of focusing on those, I made this huge revelation, which whether you're on the spectrum or not is true for you too, if you are listening to this podcast. Everything amazing about me, every single one of my strengths in Strengths Finder was because of my weaknesses. The reason I can see the patterns to the fastest path to money for you is because I don't have any empathy in my way. It's broken. I don't have it. I do not walk by anyone and know what they're feeling. The reason why I can show people how, what their zone of genius is when they take years and years trying to find their path and I'm like, this is what you should do is because I'm not confused by a whole bunch of things that get in the way, like trying to be nice and trying to connect and emotionally vibing at whatever you neurotypical people do. I don't do any of that. So I'm super blunt. And I'm like, why are you selling that? Why would you sell that? You should just like I did with Eva, um, Dr. Hassenbeck, when she was just like, well, I believe in autoimmune. I'm like, but you're an ophthalmologist for the German army. Let's do eye things. Right. And everyone else, I think, would be like either not think of it or they'd want to be nice, which I got zero of. And so it's the flip side of the same coin. The reason those things are a 10 for me are because the other things are a two. And that's when I fell in love with my ASD. And the thing that everyone on that panel with me said was the same thing, like we wouldn't trade our autism, like we're fans. And so when somebody says, well, you don't seem like someone with autism or don't, oh, the other thing we've all heard is um, don't get stuck on labels. We're like, oh no, pretty stuck on the label. Like I would never trade my faults now because my zone of genius is amazing. And I think it's the same thing they tell you about people who are blind have better hearing, people with, who are deaf have better hearing. heightens the sense. Yeah, totally. I think it's the same thing. And I yeah. think that- It's funny. I just, I just released an episode this week with someone who's blind. And oh. that's exactly what we talked about. And it, it totally, they run blind wine tasting experiences and other, uh, other things for brands to capture the other senses because obviously he doesn't have that sense. Dr. Hobie, shout out to Dr. Hobie. Oh my God, I yeah. can't wait to hear this episode. Yeah. That is so great. Yeah, yeah. And you're exactly right, yeah. So, uh, um, so who do you have to bring in from a team wise to compensate for the things that maybe yeah. you, you're focusing your strengths and not the weaknesses? Who do you have yeah. to bring in? I just know I can't manage vendors. Yeah. And so I have people on my team that do that is a little weird. Like some people get frustrated or feel slighted. Um, I can manage clients and I can do like one-on-ones, but even I do rarely do one-on-ones. I'm better in groups. Usually people think they want a one-on-one -on -one with me and then they're super disappointed by it. Um, Cause it's not what they thought it would be. And so everyone knows if you work with me, you're going to work in a group. Um, I have all of the logistics done by uh, logistics people, project managers on my team that are neurotypicals. And the reason why I think NTs are great on that is if somebody asks me once, what's the Zoom link, um, I'm happy to give it to them. If they ask me twice, my brain says, 
I should really ask them if they're an idiot. <laughs> and if they ask me three times, I like accidentally refund their money and tell them I never want to talk to them again, which is maybe an outsized reaction. So I don't even know what the Zoom link is. You could probably pay me a thousand dollars and I couldn't find it. And that's very intentional. I have my team hide things from me um, because my answer is going to be so upsetting to people for no good reason. It's just not a good thing to ask an MC. So some of the, the team members you put in place, project managers, you know, basically they can be front facing, answer questions. So you're not interacting in that one-on-one -on -one fashion. Any other key hires for you throughout? And so I hire people based on their empathy skills for certain roles. Um, so for instance, I have a high empath, not that this matters now, but rest in peace. I have a high empath who is my greeter at events. And so if somebody's off, she'll let me know, especially before a pitch. If somebody has bad energy, I hire psychics and empaths basically to read a room. Um, so if anybody in the room is likely to bring down my sales conversions, we will surprise them with like a one-on-one -on -one session with an editor and we'll pull them out of the room for my pitch. Hmm. Um, Interesting. So I don't read that at all. I don't read a room at all. Um, I'm horrible at reading. A room. It's ridiculous how bad I am at it. Um, so yeah, so I have empaths, I have psychics, um, all of my, um, my sales team are all psychic, um, and we accept people. And by psychic, I mean some combination of high intuition, high empathy, and really good at like reading vibes. Um, cause we have like a strict, uh, no assholes rule. And so if anyone, cause it's, I do group coaching. So if anyone's going to be an asshole, they're going to screw up the experience for everyone. So that's yeah. why we've gone, I've noticed there's a, I think this has to do with stress and anxiety, um, but we've gone from same ad spend, um, but taking about 30 people a month to about 20. And the reason why is there's a very high level of assholes right now. And I think because people are so freaked out about Homes, everything, playing, yeah. life, the end of the world. Um, it's harder for us to find people will accept because you have to have to work with me. Like I can make you lots of money, but to work with me, you have to have a certain amount of, uh, I always call it turgidity. I'm not sure why I call it that, but like you got to be able to handle some shit and be like, wow, I, what, whoever this woman is, she's a genius and I'll deal with whatever the quirks are. Yeah. And not taking things personally. Yeah. And if you're just in a heightened state of anxiety, which a lot of people are right now, I'm going to trigger you and we know it. So I mm. have them go through my psychics first um, and make sure like psychically they don't send that we do a little um, astrology match. We do just like a little psychic energy. That's what I was going to ask, you know, for your team, do you do like certain assessment to get like, okay, their high empathy, their positive injury, what assessment, or is that just a fee? I mean, for you, it's not a feel in general. You must be doing some kind of assessment or do you have someone else assess it? With empaths, um, all the empaths I've hired have sort of declared their empathness almost as a negative. Um, so we've had, we have three empaths on the team. And they've all written books on empathy. One of them, her book is called, um, is it I Hope I'm Not, I Don't Want to Be an Empath, is her book. Hmm. So they look at empathy, which in some ways is the counter to ASD. They'll look at empathy the way I look at ASD, like, oh, I wish I wasn't asky. I wish I didn't have a bad personality. I wish I wasn't so sensitive. I wish I didn't have to avoid people. But it's somebody that's done the work like I have with my situation and they're like, okay, now I know how to put up bubbles. I know how to use this as a superpower. I know how to click the light and turn it off. Um, so that's how I found them is they actually declare it. Um, for most of, you know, I can tell a neurotypical, um, that it's pretty obvious to me who's an NT 
And I'm pretty good at being able to assess people's disc. Um, I do have people do a fascination advantage, sometimes an Enneagram or a Myers-Briggs, but I can pretty quickly. Um, Got it. Like I would guess you're an ISTJ. I don't know. Uh, I bet I'm right. <laughs> ISTJ. Okay. It's my guess. Okay. Um, Angela, I have one last question, or actually two qu- qu- two last questions. Before I do, I want to point people to the authorincubator.com. Check out more. You have lots of great videos, um, and they can see you know exactly what you do. Um, and check out the difference, uh, the book, the difference as well. Yeah, Any in other- fact, if you click around, I think it's maybe the authorincubator.com slash free books, but all my books are free. And if you want to write a book, the difference is an amazing manual for the steps to do it. We shared some of them today, but obviously I couldn't, couldn't teach all of them. So that's yeah. free on the website or I think it's 10 bucks on Amazon, but you can get it for free on my website. Yeah, so you go to authorincubator.com. If you go to the book, should they go to the books tab or where should they go? Last free books. But what happens when you go to the books tab? Uh, let me see here. I should really know my website. Right? Um, no, if you go to actually the top, click, want to make a $10,000 with a book. Oh, that's a workshop that I did. Yeah. Oh, workshop. I'll get you. The author incubator.com slash free books will definitely get you there. So free that's books. Okay, cool. So check it out. Let her give you a book. Yes, I would love to. Don't be one of the crazy people that, no. You could be a crazy person. The two out of a hundred crazy people. Yes. Cool. Check it out. Theauthorincubator.com slash free books. Check out other parts of the website. Um, So Angela, I always ask because it's Inspired Insider, you know, what's been a low moment that you had to push through and what's been a a super proud moment um, throughout your career? Um, yeah. What's been uh, a challenging uh, moment? Well, you know, I, it's a boring answer, but COVID has been really hard. We had two 16,000 square foot venues spending about a hundred K a month just in rent. And I would have been happy to keep paying a hundred K a month in rent because I spent millions of dollars renovating these places. I don't see a world where events come back fast enough for me. So I have a kid who's a freshman and our plan has always been when he graduates. Um, My husband's from England and our deal was always when he graduates, we'll go back to England. So I got four years before I leave, two years before there's events again. If I have to figure out a whole nother business model, I'm not going to go back to doing events to just leave again. So this sped up my timeline in a way I didn't expect. It cost me probably four million bucks in the last six months and has definitely crushed my soul to have to walk away from these amazing buildings that we've designed. So I, I saw the video. Was it the author castle? Mm, we have a castle and we have the academy. And the academy was built on Georgetown's campus, just off the Georgetown campus, um, integrated with the schools, which are largely empty. <laughs> and we were doing six events a month, three at each venue. Wow. So, yes. Where is the there. author castle? What area is the author castle located? Also in D.C. on the Potomac. Oh, D.C. Oh. Yeah, it's um, beautiful. The, the video is beautiful. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. And we had an incredible six years, hundreds of events, um, and it was just gone a little bit too soon. So that's been a huge loss um, Yeah, that was really unexpected. But at the same time, super weird, um, my whole adult life, um, I guess since college, My favorite author was a woman named Marianne Williamson. I found her book, A Return to Love, in 1992, and it really set the course of my life. She made a bunch of tapes that were released by Sounds True. I think there were a million, and I listened to each of them a million times. 
There's probably nothing she said that I hadn't memorized in 20 years. And on January 1st, in a weird turn of events, she walked into my life, literally. She walked into the academy building. She hasn't walked out yet. Uh, she's become my best friend, my business partner, my roommate for a while. And um, it's so strange and surreal to have the person who inspired so much of what I do now coaching our authors. And of course, everything we say is in total alignment because everything I do, I learned from her. So I hear my words coming out of her mouth and realize, oh, I got them from her. So I guess they're her words I've been saying, wait, what happened? Um, so even all the books I recommend or all the books she recommends, and I'm like, this is crazy. We recommend the same books. And then I'm like, oh, probably got them because you recommended them. So uh, that's pretty fun and wild and weird. And she feels like my business soulmate. She said to me on the first day we met, I feel like I've waited 20 years to meet you. And I was like, um, nope, pretty sure that's me. I'm going to, that's my line. Um, so it's kind of exciting. She's a couple blocks up the road. We're going to have dinner in a few minutes. And um, we're changing the world together in all the ways I imagined in my childhood fantasies. Um, so she's like the big sister I never had. And um, it's so fun to create with her um, because she is someone who's been such a huge, I mean, that's the fantasy, right? I'm going to be on stage someday with my mentor. I'm going to, they'll want me to be their business partner. And here it is happening. I love it. Angela, are there any books right now we should give a shout out to? Well, listen, you got to read Marian Williamson's uh, okay. her book, A Politics of Love, which is her newest book. Mm -hmm. um, is obviously about what we need to make the world a better place right now in the U.S. and beyond. And, uh, you know, her, her perennial bestseller, uh, A Return to Love, if you haven't read that, is a game changer um, for everyone. So, yeah, I would always recommend Marianne's books. I think that is uh, really what the world needs right now is more love. Cool. Angela, I'm the first one to thank you. Everyone check out the author incubator.com. Absolute pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.